Welcome everybody. Today we are going to discuss the Ayurvedic art of skin assessment. And this topic is part of our Ayurveda Health Counselor certification program. My name is John Immel. This is what I look like. And the first question we're going to ask is, why study the skin? Well, the um, first answer to that is, well, everyone sees your skin. Naturally, you want people to see the best of you. Beautiful skin is attractive. That's probably the reason why many of my clients want brighter skin. Um, but from an Ayurveda practitioner point of view, uh, we study the skin um, not just for vanity reasons. Um, we study the skin not, not just because the skin is about being beautiful. Uh, we study the skin because the skin is a great barometer of your health. You can almost say that it's a mirror, uh, that it reveal, reveals underlying imbalances in your body. In fact, just by looking at your skin, an Ayurveda practitioner can uh, learn vital information about your health. Now, most of us are used to looking at a person's face in the morning, you know, when we first see them at work or whatever, and we can, you know, we're, by looking at their face, we can see some health data or health information about them. Uh, you know, did they have a good uh, night's sleep last night? And um, are they stressed out? Um, are they, um, how, how are they doing in general? Or even what's their age? Uh, we're used to seeing that information when we look at a person's skin. However, an Ayurveda practitioner, um, an Ayurveda health counselor is going to see so much more than that. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's what we're going to discuss in today's lecture. So how, do, how does Ayurveda look at the skin? Well, we see the skin as a membrane, right? It is a membrane. Um, and, uh, and why is that important? Because in a way, our whole body is a series of membranes wrapped around membranes. If you look at any organ uh, or any part of the body, you see there's just lots of membranes. Um, and they're all wrapped around each other. Uh, so, uh, of course, there's a lot of functional cells in each of our organs, but there's a lot of membranes as well. And so when we're looking at the skin as a membrane and the health of the skin, what we're looking at is the health of all of our membranes throughout the body. And, um, and so that skin is going to be the, our barometer um, one of the most important barometers of your general health, uh, revealing so much about the body. Uh, skin is a way to judge your diet, uh, also your digestive strength. Uh, if you're um, to have healthy skin, you need to have well nourished skin, and well nourished skin comes from well-nourished blood plasma and well-nourished blood plasma comes from good digestion so are you eating the right foods are you digesting them well are you able to nourish your blood and therefore nourish your skin uh, by looking at the skin we'll be able to get some information about that if um yeah we'll get information about it simple enough if a person has weak digestion their skin is going to look uh, dull and lusterless. But if a, a person is eating good foods and digesting well, they'll have, they're more likely to have a glowing complexion. Digestion isn't the whole story, of course. Uh, nourishment's not the whole story either, but it is an essential, necessary factor. <clears throat> what will you learn about skin in this talk? you will uh, learn step by step the art of skin assessment. You'll learn a detailed analysis of signs and symptoms. Uh, you'll learn about color, temperature, thickness, complexion, and more. Uh, we're gonna talk about the importance of skin assessment a little bit more. Why, why do you care? Uh, how to use it as a clinical tool. We'll discuss basic anatomy of the skin. We'll review some common skin disorders from an Ayurvedic perspective. And uh, we'll also talk about a summary of uh, skin by dosha. All right, let's jump in about the skin. Well, uh, normal skin, healthy skin, or actually another way to say this is ideal skin, uh, should be slightly unctuous and oily. It should be supple, not dry or rough, but not clammy either. And here we see a person 
uh, a photo here on the right of a person with beautiful skin and we notice that the skin looks a little bit oily but not very shiny right it doesn't look dry at all uh, the skin doesn't look too thin but it doesn't look too thick um, there's no wrinkles in the skin or few wrinkles it's smooth without blemishes or any rashes and it's glowing now when we say glowing skin it's not like a glow worm that's emitting light or anything like that but there's some vibrant brightness to the skin which you can clearly see in this photo and, uh, and there should be some rosiness in the cheeks and if you look real close you'll see that uh, uh, this young lady's right cheek uh, <coughs> excuse me does have a little bit of rosiness to it all right what are some of the functions of the skin what does skin do for you uh, why does your body even have skin? Well, skin offers protection. It's a physical barrier between your body and the outside world that protects you from microorganisms, radiation, climatic changes, etc. It main helps maintain your body temperature and skin maintains warmth in three ways. Through your body hair, through insulating layers of fat in the skin, and also regulating the uh, dilation of blood vessels. So contracting and dilating blood vessels will bring blood closer to the surface of your skin or restrict it farther from the surface. So when you have goosebumps, all of your uh, blood vessels are tight and constricted, reducing blood flow to the skin. And when you're on a hot summer day, your skin uh, blood vessels will be dilated, making uh, your face red. <clears throat> so uh, skin can cool down your body by sweating and also dilating blood vessels close to the surface of the skin. Your skin is, what's another function of the skin? Your skin is a sensory organ. You can experience touch on your skin. I remember the feeling of a tick crawling up my leg once and that tick was very tiny. It was actually a deer tick, the kind of tick that causes Lyme's disease. And I could hardly see it, but I could feel it, especially as it brushed by some of the hairs on my leg. And then I removed the tick and potentially saved myself from getting Lyme's. Now that's incredible, right? So uh, we experience touch on the skin. We experience pressure, pain, movement, and also temperature. Uh, we can also experience the emotions of a touch, a loving touch versus a slap in the face, for example. Uh, skin also helps us uh, keep our fluids in, right? Um, you're, if you've ever had a cut, you see that your cut leaks fluid. Well, the skin prevents leaking of that fluid. And it assists, uh, your skin assists in the removal of wastes uh, that should... Um, uh, that should be really highlighted here, that the skin helps you remove waste products from your body. What about skin anatomy? Here's a, a picture of skin anatomy. We see the epidermis at the top layer here, and then uh, a little bit further down, we see the dermis in the middle, and then the subcutaneous tissue, three basic layers. Uh, in Western anatomy for the skin, in Ayurveda, you'll see we look at seven layers to the skin. Uh, but look at all these different structures here. <coughs> Excuse me. We see hair follicles. Uh, we see sweat glands. We see capillaries here. We see nerves that are sensing touch, etc. Uh, we see some muscles uh, in the skin. Uh, we see sebaceous glands. Uh, all kinds of things are going on in your skin. Your skin is actually quite complex. It's also the largest organ of your body, so let's not forget that. What about, um, let's go through the epidermis a little bit here. The epidermis is the top layer, and it provides tone to the skin. There it is again. Um, it acts as a barrier. It varies in, in thickness. Your eyelids are the thinnest skin in your body uh, with 0.5 millimeter, and the soles of your feet, <coughs> excuse me, have the thickest epidermis, and that is at four millimeter, and that thickness is there to protect your feet, right? 
uh, your epidermis is constantly renewing. In fact, here's a good picture of just the epidermis. And we see this top layer of skin flaking off here. And this is what happens in the epidermis is that we have new cells being formed in the bottom. And then the cells die and they start to layer up and they form this thick protective layer of dead skin cells uh, that are the final barrier there. So, um, so it takes about four uh, weeks for this whole process of a new cell being formed in the lower layer of the epidermis to the um, cells uh, moving to the top layer, getting a little bit hard, and then finally shedding off. So in here you see that little Merkel cell in the bottom here, the blue. Uh, here is a cell that is um, sensing pressure and then a melanocyte here that's causing the color or pigmentation in your skin. All right, so, oh yeah, here they are, the epidermis, several cell types, the melanocytes that are producing pigment, the melanin pigment, and the more sun exposure you have, <coughs> the more melanin your body produces, and that's why you get a tan. Um, <clears throat> And that uh, tan, it gives you some protection from the UV rays. It protects your body from harmful UV uh, light waves. Uh, lymphocytes in the epidermis can fight off harm harmful bacteria, and the Merkel cells, as I mentioned, allow you to feel pressure. The dermis is the layer underneath the epidermis, and that's a thicker layer. It has tough connective tissue in it, it's full of sweat glands and hair follicles and dense, tough collagen fibers. It, um, it makes your skin have this property of being strong yet flexible. Isn't that amazing that our skin is strong yet flexible? Uh, so the dermis can stretch, and guess what? It can also tear, and that's what a stretch mark is. The uh, dermis contains nerve fibers and capillaries and these capillaries are transporting nutrients and oxygen to uh, your skin, basically. And those capillary beds also help you cool down uh, by bringing hot blood close to the surface of the skin where, that skin, where that heat gets radiated away. So here we see it again, the epidermis and the dermis. Then let's take a look at the subcutaneous layer which is the fatty layer that helps regulate body temperature. And it, this basically contains a bunch of small cavities filled with fat and water. And uh, this fat doesn't just uh, help you regulate body temperature, but it's also a shock absorber. It cushions blows to your body. So if you fall or whatever you do, it protects your bones, your joints, etc. So it uh, insulating qualities for temperature and a shock absorber. And also those fat cells in your skin produce hormones. Great, we've reviewed the Western anatomy on skin. How about um, Ayurveda's perspective on skin? Let's talk about that. Have you ever boiled milk? What happens when you boil milk? After a few minutes, a skin forms on the top. And here we see a picture on the right of uh, the skin being uh, lifted off out of the pot here, and it's on that spoon. Hopefully you can make that out and see that well. Um, but basically the, the, the idea is that the nutrients, the sugars, fats, and proteins rise to the surface of the pot and form that skin. This, is, uh, this metaphor is the way Ayurveda uh, looks at the skin's relationship to the blood. That the, um, that the creme de la creme of the skin, or the best of, the, excuse me, the creme de la creme of the blood, or the best of the blood, the com nourishing components of the blood, rise to the surface and form your skin. So in this example, the blood is like the milk and the skin on the surface of the boiling milk is like your skin. Poetically, in Ayurveda, the skin is the cream of the blood, you might say. Um, 
More specifically, or to put this in Ayurvedic terms, we say that the top layer of the skin is a secondary tissue of the plasma or the upadhatu of the plasma. And that's rasa, the plasma is rasa datu in Ayurveda, just to throw out some of those Sanskrit terms. And we say that the quality of the skin is only as good as your blood chemistry. So healthy blood makes glowing skin. And toxic poor quality blood leads to skin disorders, acne, eczema, psoriasis, and uh, dull, lifeless skin. So um, we create a lot of importance on the assessment of skin because that's how what's one of the main ways that we assess constitution and imbalances. Um, it's also the skin says a lot about the blood. I just talked about the relationship between skin and blood. So we use skin to assess the qualities of blood plasma and the red part of the blood called rasa and rakta in Ayurveda. We can use the skin to assess all major organs, lungs, heart, liver, spleen, kidney, digestion, etc. And um, all the time remembering that problems on the skin point to imbalances deep beneath the surface. So in Ayurveda, when someone comes to us with a skin problem, we don't immediately think of topical treatments. We don't immediately think of, oh, what herbs could I put on that rash? We think, what is going on inside the person's body that's causing that rash? And so uh, treatments are often internal, not topical. We might um, add, we might include a topical treatment, but we, we're always looking to deal with the root and what's going on systematically in the person's body. And, um, and so a lot of our treatments of skin are internal, not topical. Sushruta, one of the authors of the classical Ayurvedic texts, um, says that in Ayurv that the skin has seven layers. And he says this in the Sushruta Samhita, which is again one of the classic texts. And uh, and one of the, the first one layer is called the Avabasini layer, which is a reflective layer. It's the outermost layer, kind of like the epidermis, or maybe even one of the layers in the epidermis, because as you saw in that picture, not too far ago here, the epidermis itself is multiple layers, right? Um, so this Avabasini is the outer layer and it shows complexion. Uh, and Sushruta says this layer must be cared for with regular massage, adequate hydration, etc. And that it's in this layer that psoriasis and acne form. I want to say, as I go through these seven layers, I want to mention that um, these layers are contemplative, are something for you to contemplate. They don't necessarily reflect um, a um, neatly separated anatomical um, analysis that we're used to looking at skin under a microscope. But we should be looking at these different uh, parts or component, almost look at these as different components of the skin. Although Sushruta does say that these seven layers are one on top of the other, um, uh, I think that we should think of these more as different components of the skin. That's at least how I approach it. So Lohita is the reddish layer and uh, that supports the outer layer and indicates health of your Raktadatu, the red part of the blood. And um, this layer is associated with um, pathologies such as dark circles or moles or dark pigmentation. And what Sushruta is saying there is that the health of the red part of the blood and even pitta dosha in general and the liver and these moles and dark pigmentation are all going to sort of be working together or there are problems in one will cause problems in the other. Then there's the shweta or the white layer and that is said to balance the skin's color, um, lightening up the darker colors of the inner layers. And we, we see that our skin is lighter than what's underneath the skin. And so there's this white layer, maybe that's where the fat is. Um, I don't know what Susrut is pointing at there, uh, but again, this is our contemplation. So imbalances there could be eczema, blisters, and moles, according to 
uh, shushuta. The next layer of skin is called tamra, and this is the pigment layer that nurtures and protects the upper layers of the skin. And it supports the immune system, it performs the skin's role as a barrier, and um, an imbal some of the imbalances in this section are skin infection. Uh, Vandini is the sensory layer that's responsible for sensory perception. It links the skin to the rest of the body or the nerves. And uh, imbalances here would include things like herpes or painful skin conditions. Then there is Rohini, the proliferating part of the skin that supports the healing and regeneration of the skin. And imbalances here could result in poor healing of the skin, but also um, excess growths like cancerous tumors are a, a, a regeneration that's gone amok or gone awry, uh, cysts as well. Uh, Shushruta includes in this layer. <clears throat> Mamsadara, the muscle supporting layer. This is the innermost layer. It supports the skin's stability and firmness, suppleness and youthfulness. And imbalances in this layer include abscesses, fistulas, and all right, general causes of skin pathology. So um, what causes uh, skin problems or what are the fundamental, what are the, what is the foundation or the root causes of many skin problems and first and foremost is listed here the quality of blood plasma which Ayurveda calls rasadhatu and mainly toxins in this uh, in your lymphatic system really in your blood plasma these toxins make your skin gray and lifeless uh, Ama is considered to be the number one cause of, of in skin inflammation, puffy skin, and acne too. Now, of course, there are other causes, but these, this is a real main one here. Uh, we also, uh, the blood plasma, problems in imbalances in blood plasma could cause water retention. Um, salt can cause water retention even. Uh, swelling, puffiness, kapha aggravating foods like too much bread, or carbohydrates can make a person uh, retain lots of water. Lack of uh, physical activity can cause water retention as well. And, uh, and signs that the skin has retained too much water is swollen or puffy skin or um, skin that has, that's edematic. Now your blood plasma or your lymphatic system uh, can be dry also and that's gonna to lead to more wrinkling. So instead of being puffy, swollen, and smooth, it's gonna be wrinkled. And anytime you're seeing wrinkles and cracks on the skin, on the tongue, anywhere in the body, you know that we're looking at dehydration. So uh, that could be simple as not drinking enough water, but too much sweating, or um, vomiting, diarrhea, or diuretics. Right, all of that is going to cause excess fluid loss. So where's, think about how much water you're taking in, but also think of how much water is leaking out of your body whenever you're addressing uh, chronic dehydration. And dry skin, uh, if there's dehydration, the skin will look drier, rougher, uh, excuse me, thinner in general. The skin may be wrinkled, lips may be a little cracked. All right, another uh, thing that can cause problems in your blood plasma. We've talked about uh, uh, ama or toxins. We've talked about water retention in the, um, in the blood plasma. We've talked about dehydration of blood plasma, but also I just wanna mention for a second kidney problems because this factors into skin also. Kidney weaknesses, you're gonna see it on the skin. If there is um, poor elimination of toxins by the kidney, the kidney is a detox organ, and so it's supposed to eliminate toxins from your lymph, from your blood plasma, and if it doesn't do that well, there's gonna be a buildup, and you're gonna see that on the skin. Um, and of course, it's the kidney that could be the cause of too much or too little water retention. 
damage to the kidney can sometimes make the kidney leaky where it uh, loses excess fluids and nutrients or can make your kidney retentive where it's unable to flush toxins and fluids. So it can go in either direction. And um, sometimes the presence of AMA, by the way, in the kidney can cause your kidneys to be constantly trying to filter those toxins out of the blood. That's gonna result in um, higher volume of urination. You're gonna basically be peeing a lot and that's gonna make you dehydrated. That's a condition called kidney flushing, by the way, when toxins cause you to pee a lot. Uh, here's a picture of skin um, in a person who is having kidney failure. And you see that all these toxins that are building up in their blood are irritating the skin. And this person's probably itching themselves like crazy, by the way. All right, let's move away from the blood plasma now and talk about how imbalances in the red part of the blood, rukta datu, can cause skin problems. Basically, you, if your blood gets hot and fiery, then you're gonna have uh, inflammation in your skin. So uh, the blood vessels are gonna be showing, you'll have uh, redness in the skin, fl flushed red skin, and causes of that uh, hot and fiery blood can be alcohol, spicy foods, oily foods and meats. And uh, also, uh, I think I mentioned it here, liver problems, we'll get to that in just a second. So yeah, you can get hot and fiery from liver problems too. Anyway, uh, if so sometimes the blood's too hot and fiery, but sometimes if the, if, if the red part of the blood is really deficient, like in an anemic person, then the blood's gonna be very cold and pale. And, uh, and that's going to uh, cause, yeah, pale, cold skin and dry, uh, rough or cracked skin. So here we see um, pitta toxins. Look at this angry acne here. Uh, there's some, some of them are infected. There's some whiteheads there. Uh, it's cystic acne. It's really deep into the skin. It's not just a little surface thing. Um, <clears throat> so the liver, just like the kidney, is a major detox organ. But the liver is not associated with blood plasma in Ayurveda. It's associated with the rakta-datu, or red part of the blood. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Actually, the liver can be associated with both. It can be um, associated with the blood plasma or the red part of the blood, but here we're including under the red part of the blood. And if the liver is too weak to detoxify the blood, then uh, the toxins will be eliminated through the skin. But in this case, it'll be a little bit more pitta signs associated with it. Rashes, acne, outbreaks, and lots of things can weaken your liver, including an infection, hepatitis, right? Uh, but too much toxins, drugs and pharmaceuticals, stress, anger, worry, and intense emotions, poor sleep, alcohol, etc., etc. Lots of things can hurt your liver. Poor circulation can uh, cause skin problems. So the skin is a highly vascularized organ it's supposed to have good, strong blood, blood flow, and really it can be too much or too little or just right. Um, but your skin needs strong, good peripheral circulation in order to function well, and good circulation refreshes your skin. It kind of makes it glow. It makes your skin look vibrant. It brings vitality to your skin. It nourishes the skin. It eliminates ama from the skin. And circulation can be hampered by vasoconstriction when your blood vessels tighten especially this happens in winter when it's cold out all your blood vessels tighten up to keep your heat in circulation can be hampered by dehydration it can be hampered by highly viscous thick blood that flows like molasses um, it can be hampered by a weak heart or a poor breathing rate and depth so Circulation can be hampered by many factors, and all of those are going to 
be uh, reflect on the skin. Um, digestive problems will cause skin problems. Mentioned that already uh, um, a little bit earlier. But good blood, good circulation is a great foundation for skin. But you also need um, to have uh, good strong digestion and good strong agni in general. Remember when we say the word agni, if you know this word already, um, agni does not just refer to good digestion uh, or your digestive fire, but your whole bodily fire, your whole metabolism. So healthy skin, if to have healthy skin, you need to have a healthy metabolism. You need to have a healthy deha agni. Um, strong, healthy metabolism is essential to vital, uh, glowing skin. And uh, strong digestion nourishes the skin. So you have no ama. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about that already. Poor digestion can cause lots of ama formation, fermentation of food. Uh, causes lots of ama to build up and poor absorption could simply cause your skin to lack nourishment. If you're not absorbing nutrients, you're not, your skin's not going to be nourished by those nutrients. All right. <clears throat> if your metabolism is too low, then you're going to have trouble losing weight, right? And your skin is going to start to look puffy, stagnant, um, your lymphatic system is going to be sluggish and stagnant. So you need a good, strong agni, a good, strong um, uh, bodily fire or metabolism to burn off toxins, to keep things moving. Um, uh, if your metabolism is too high, it's going to um, burn off too much fat from your skin and your skin's gonna end up looking really thin, deficient and dry. <laughs> so think about how your metabolism might be influencing the qualities you see in your skin. All right, the amount of ojas in your body and the amount of fat tissue in your body is going to affect your skin. So ojas really, um, I'm using ojas in the sense here as just very well nourished skin. Um, of course, ojas means a little more than that. I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, but if you have adequate fat in your skin, then your skin is gonna be thick, soft, um, and supple. And it's gonna be full and plump looking. There'll be no, there'll be no sagging. Uh, skin will be smooth, soft, and unctuous. And we see that balanced unctuousness of the skin in this photo of Oprah Winfrey here. But if your fat is depleted, your skin is going to look thin and dry and wrinkly. Uh, one thing we, uh, which I want to mention in relation to fat is essential fatty acids, including omega-3s and 6s, that help your skin to maintain the cell structure. Um, and also protect your skin against damage and help your skin with efficient repair. Also, it strengthens your skin. And a lack of these fatty acids uh, makes, your, uh, there's the, makes it so that there's a deficient protective oil barrier on your skin. So we want to maintain the, uh, a diet with uh, good quantities of essential fatty acids. And... Um, here are some good sources of fatty acids. Um, oily fish, such as salmons and sardines. Nuts and seeds, such as found in walnuts, linseeds, and chia seeds. Um, also certain oils, like flaxseed oil and cod liver oil. These are all rich in essential fatty acids. Pathogens called krumi in Ayurveda or parasites and bugs and things that infect your skin are called krumi in Ayurveda and those can also be a cause of skin problems. Strep A, Strep B, staph infections, um, etc, etc. I listed a few here. HPV causing warts, herpes simplex, tinea, candida, lots of different krumis 
that can affect your skin. And you can pause on this slide and, and, uh, and write these down if you want. Sun exposure can cause skin problems, including uh, damage from UV rays, can cause actually skin cancer. Um, it can cause you to get lots of freckles. Um, it can dry out your skin and lead to premature aging or sagging skin. And aging itself also is a cause of skin problems. Over time, your skin loses elasticity and collagen. And then the integrity of the skin starts to degenerate, causing wrinkles, liver spots, dry skin, uh, sagging skin, and very fragile skin that bruises easily and tears easily and cuts easily. And also the skin will have a slower healing rate. Finally, and look at the, think about all the ways that your skin can get hurt, right? Look at this big list I'm giving you with <clears throat> so many different ways that your skin could have problems. Uh, well, your skin's on the outside of your body, so it's exposed to a lot, right? But also we have trauma to the skin, cuts from any number of things. Uh, my kids, when they run in the street and skin their knee or... If I cut myself while cooking with a knife or burn it in the oven, uh, touching the pan of the oven, which I pretty much do that every time I cook something in the oven, um, it seems like. And uh, I remember uh, touching the muffler on a lawnmower once by accident. Boy, that was a bad burn too. And um, so, you know, these o an open wound on your skin can be prone to infection and when it heals, it could form a scar too. You could have exposure to allergens, and those allergens could cause a reaction on the skin. So it could be from something you ate, and then you break out in hives or something like that on the skin, um, a medication allergy or food allergy, or it could be external, something you touch, like poison ivy, or certain chemicals could cause a allergic reaction. And then the skin reacts in an with an inflammatory response. And it gets itchy, irritated, red, swollen, sensitive, etc. Your genetic makeup can be a cause of skin pathology. So some examples of that include uh, that may have a genetic effector include psoriasis, uh, vitiligo, and eczema. But you know, it's not. We're not saying that uh, it's only your genes that are playing a role. Uh, there are usually other factors involved too. All right, so let's just do a little recap on the general causes of skin pathology. We had your genes, allergens, trauma, aging, sun exposure, crumy or pathogens, uh, your, the amount of fat in your, t in your skin, metabolism and digestion, uh, circulation, the red part of your blood and liver health, the blood plasma, and kidney health. Lots of different types of causes. Hopefully by going through them a bit more slowly, uh, you um, have a little bit of an inkling of the angles we're going to take uh, to help heal a person's skin. All right, are you still with me? We've gone over anatomy of the skin. Actually, we started with the importance of skin analysis. We went over the Western and Ayurvedic anatomy of the skin. And then uh, I just went through uh, some um, of the main causes of skin problems.